I mean, okay, we are live. We are back with Tuesday Night Talmud. It is a, an absolute pleasure to welcome all of you here. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Yes, yes. very well. Yes. Great. Oh, okay, and we have- Everyone one. hear me, okay? Hey, yeah. now, yeah. Oh, that's, that's what's important. Um, so Marvin, even if they can't understand you, we can take solace in the fact that the Giants are rapidly approaching first place in the NFC East. And with that, I'm um, gonna- Can you say winning streak? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> we are continuing with B'nai Ha'ir. Um, now, for people who um, may not have their own Gemara, um, we could do this in different ways. I could follow it on Svaria with a screen share. Is that easier for people? Do people mm -hmm. like what the text is scrolling in front of you? Yes. Do. So we'll do that. But, and I think last time you also sent the link, which I liked being able to go back and forth. Yeah, so I'll do that too. Oh. Okay, so let me just get the link in the chat. For those in an old fashioned Gemara, we're on 26A. Uh, Copy. Okay, in the chat. So I've got the link to where we are in the chat. Ooh. And I also share it on the screen. Magic. Okay. So we had finished the mission. We're thinking about space, friends. We're, we're thinking about space. Um, and in particular, what makes space holy, sanctified? Um, and when space is sanctified, what does that mean? going to mute everyone because I'm getting an echo from someone and I'll ask people to unmute themselves if they want to say something so I'll do this mute all and Peter Berman is here okay cool <clears throat> so again um, and I muted everyone to kill any echo but please unmute yourself at your leisure or hit the space bar if you're not on a phone um, I think best might be joining us on a phone um, to say something at any point. So we had done the Mishnah a few weeks back, you may recall, about this general principle of ma'alim v'kodesh ve'in moridin, that if you want to sell different ritual objects, you have to go up with the money, yeah? You have to elevate the purpose of the money. So if you sell um, a shul, what can you buy with a shul? A Torah. A Torah, but you always have to be going up in Kedusha. That was the general idea. And then we discussed a debate, you may recall, about the what happens when you daven in the street adjacent to the shul on the road. Does the road get Kedusha? And this was relevant for us because we, well, where are we davening right now? Nowhere right now. But in, when we're davening, we're davening, uh, we are davening in a courtyard adjacent to the place we're otherwise going to be davening. Which brings up even a further question, which is what if you daven in a place that isn't only for davening, but is for other things? So is it, what, like what happens to the sanctity of these sorts of multi-purpose spaces? So you may remember that Rabbi Menachem Bar Yossi, there was a machlokas, Rabbi Menachem Bar Yossi, who's opinion is quoted by name in the Tosefta. The Tosefta uh, is a compilation to the Mishnah, um, which is a little more inclus inclusive. Rabbi Oshia has other things in the Mishnah doesn't. It's quoted by name there as saying, if you daven in the road adjacent to the shul, sometimes it gets Kedusha. Whereas the Chachamim came and said, no, because you only daven there sometimes. And that's not enough. Came the Rashba, a Rishon, and said, well, when we say it doesn't have Kedusha, what we mean is that there's no restriction on selling the street. But because you daven there sometimes, you still can't urinate there. 
You remember that Rashba? And the Rashba said, and so too cemetery roads. Cemetery roads are also a little bit kadosh because the people, you know, you do the funeral service on the cemetery roads. So that's more or less sort of where we got. Yeah, any questions about what we had done? So I'm gonna pick up with something that I think we almost started, but we'll do it again. People see it, do you need it bigger? Beza Knesses, Lochin Teva. So the general matter, if you sell a shul, you can buy an Aron Kodesh. If you sell a shul, you can take the money and buy an Aron Kodesh because an Aron Kodesh is holier than a shul. So all of this presumes what? It presumes that you are in fact allowed to sell a shul. We are presuming the matter. You know, people came to me and asked me when the thought came to sell our building. I think it was Marvin Stark who came to me and said, Rabbi, can we sell our shul? Didn't you ask me something like that? You know, you said like, can we sell a building? Right, that, that was the question, was it the question? Something like that. So other people ask me, can you, can you sell a shul? Before we say, so it seems like if you say, well, if you sell a shul, you can buy an ark, that we're presuming that you're allowed to sell a shul, yeah? Otherwise, so the Gemara is gonna test that. Amar Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani, Amar Rabbi Yonasan. Lo shanu ala beza knesa shel kfarim. Aval beza knesa shel krachin, ki even de me'alma asule, lo matzi mizavni le da havale de rabim. So, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani says in the name of Rabbi Yonatan, this was only taught that you could sell a shul altogether about a shul of a small village, but a shul of, a, of the krachin, which are large cities, since me alma atule from the world they come there. Me alma from the world atu they come lay to it. Lo matzu mezivni le da havale de rabim. So there's this idea that you can't sell a shul that is um, a shul of a large city. Now why not? Does anyone? Well, I mean, the Gemara gives a reason. I have a comment. Yeah. Um. I'm assuming that this applies if your shul is the only shul in the city. If there's another shul in the city that visitors could come to daven at, it, the restriction would be lifted or not? Sorry, you briefly cut out for the last 10 okay. seconds of what you so said. Try if there's more than one shul, if your shul is one of two or three or four shuls in the city, do you have more le more leeway to sell your shul since there are other shuls that visitors to the city can go attend? And we're going to get there in the Gemara where, you know, there's one shul that's the, this kind of shul or one shul that these people founded, but not those people, even though it's a large city. And we'll see those exceptions. Um, but yeah, so me'almu atu, like, the, there's two ways you could look at this. And you could see it in Tosafot. So I'm going to do a little... Faria magic. Look at this. There's a Tosafot. Everyone see the Tosafot now? Kevan de Meama Ka'atulai? Do people see that? I mean, I clicked on my screen. I don't know if anything happened on your screens. Yeah? Tosafot says the following. Nira le Farish Hachi. Kevan Sharov B'nei Adam. You could explain it this way. Kevan Sharov B'nei Adam Regidim Lalecha Sham Lispalel. Since many people go there to pray, even though they never supported it monetarily. By the way, I like to say, freeloading has been a long-standing Jewish problem. You, have the Tavali, you know, everyone goes there. Of course, no one donates to the thing. No one pays, but everyone expects it to exist, which I, you know, once I became a rabbi, um, Allow me to vent for a moment. Every week I get requests from people. My great grandfather belonged to Beshalom in 1922. This is the most recent one. And I would really like you to do this for me. Now, after all, we were really significant members back in the 30s. And I have taken lately, because it's the coronavirus, and you can be blunt, to saying, that's really nice. What have you done for us in the last 80 years? So um, maybe that's not the nice way to be pastorally, but 
um, there is a sense in which people have an obligation to support, but here we're talking about travelers, right? We're talking really about travelers that come, not people in the city that want it and don't support it. So Tosifo says, he's not really talking about freeloading, he's really talking about they don't, they don't contribute financially, that's not the point. The point is that they expect it to be there. It's a, in other words, it's like, um, it's a international Jewish treasure. It's a public heritage site, like the Western Wall. So actually, another way to look at it might be that, you know, talking, you know, when, when in the Talmudic times, you didn't have television, telephones or, or telegraphs or anything like that. So I'm living 200 miles away from the city. And two years ago, I came and I davened at that shul. I'm simply, I can probably simply assume that shul still exists. And I'm going to make that city my stop because I know there's a shul there. Um, whether or not I've contributed to it or not, I know that there's a shul there. And if the shul gets sold without my knowledge, I can get messed up. I'm planning to stop in there and there's no shul. Right, so I think- I just, uh, by the way, changed my background to Congregation oh, yes. Beth Joseph in Tupper Lake, built in 1905 as the Peddler's Synagogue. And if you want it to be there, we could use some money. <laughs> so that's the issue, right? So, so, and when we wanted to set the Broad Street Synagogue, we needed to get approval, interestingly, from the National Park Service. You could write this up, by the way, we should. Because this actually hits on the issue. The Broad Street Synagogue Shari Tzedek ah. was on the U.S. Historic Register. So in a sense, what are you doing legally when you place something on the U.S. Historic Register? Do you make the shul board have to submit an application to the National Park Service in order to sell it? That's what you do. But by doing that, you're essentially saying the shul doesn't belong to you. You, Beth Shalom, thought you got Shari Tzedek and then it flooded and then it became a disaster and you have to sell. But really... We own Shari Tzedek, or at least we have a right to reject what you want to do with it because it's a public resource. So I think, why is it a public resource? So some of it's what Donnie's saying, right? You expect shuls, especially in large cities, to continue to exist. Oh, they could relocate, yeah. Um, uh, but um, some of it, I think, is that it doesn't belong to the people who would sell it. They don't have that right because since everyone goes there, that's not the reason, that's not the siba, that's the siman, that's the, the, the sign that really the people who are the board members aren't owners, they're more like stewards or trustees. Does that make sense? Um, yes, but don't they, aren't there designated people to, who are designated by the shul to be, uh, uh, allowed to sell it. So, uh, the so small we're villages, get... I think they're called the uh, the three Fashuba people in the city. They're not the three village idiots. No. So the <laughs> so you're right, but here's the issue, Donna. You're you're basically right, but this is serving as a kind of exception to that rule. We're going to get to that rule, which we haven't learned. But the exception to that rule about the board of functionally being able to sell a shul is not in a large city. So what do we mean? I think what we mean, and I'll just say it like this, is I don't think the Turo Synagogue Board could vote halakhically to sell that shul. I don't think they could do it if they wanted. Because well, that, that was the issue in the lawsuit they had about the uh, renomi. Right, well, that was one of the issues in the fight. So this issue itself was litigated, this issue of halakha, which is an interesting thing, right? Which is that they couldn't sell it because and that was one of the issues. Does halakha allow, um, and, and the, the judge spoke at Congregation Beth Shalom on this, as I recall. No, Judge McConnell spoke to us. I wasn't able to go. I was sick with the flu. But again, and here I am, again, the same. But um, the, this is one of the issues. So, Donnie, if it's a, a city like that, yeah. even, the even the board can't vote to sell it. That's what the Gemara is saying. And Tosvos is giving one line of reasoning, which is because it's not really yours. It's really the whole Jewish communities. Uh, it's like the state of Israel. Sometimes people have this debate about the state of Israel. Is it for all of Jewry or is it just for itself, you know? Um, and then the, the con con contrapositive version of that, uh, 
should be care. But so um, I'm not getting into that. I'm just okay. So he gives another reason. Um, so even though they don't give money, mikoma kum kevan de ladas osan rabim naase chamurak du shaso. Since it was made with everyone, with the broad public in mind, it's Kedusha is very, it's, it's got a higher level of Kedusha. So Tosavos is now entering into the gray. It's not just that a synagogue can be holy. There are levels of Kedusha. Holy, but you can sell it. Holy, but you can sell it. So Revovaj Yosef had Chuvot about synagogues in Cairo, um, similarly, as the community was starting to wane about you know, can you can you sell the main synagogue in Cairo? Cairo is Cairo, you know, it's a big place. Um, okay. You can't sell it. But there's another opinion in the Rishon. I mean, if you dig, you'll see all of these, but Tosef will summarize them. No, it's not that. It's a different issue. So the issue of naming rights. And we experienced this issue when we went to sell our shul. I think Marvin, again, got a lot of the emails and, and Will Krieger, you know, everyone that ever donated a parochet, a sign, it's not demeaning it, but in other words, people contributed money to the building and now you're selling the building. This comes up not just in shul context. I believe there was a famous lawsuit with NYU. Is that right? They accepted a lot of money. Anyone know the details of the NYU case? They accepted a lot of money to name a certain school, a Cooper Union, Cooper Union. There was an issue with Cooper Union. I'm not going to get the details right. Maybe someone who's a legal expert or a lawyer, particularly a bankruptcy expert who's on this, can help us if they know the details or not. But the uh, some issue with naming rights where they, they had a lot of money um, to certain naming rights, and then they got in a lot of financial trouble, um, I think, through some shady real estate dealings. Um, and the prime real estate market, you know, collapsed, everything that happened in 2008 to 2011 happened, and they needed more money, and then they were running just 10 years later to rename buildings for more money. So the question became, details more or less accurate, doesn't matter. If you name a building for a million dollars in 2000 and then find yourself broke in 2010, can you take $2 million, cut the name of Jones off the building, and put the name of Cohen on the building? Sorry to play into stereotypes here. So... So can you do that? You know, especially if Jones sues and says, hey, I paid you a, a lot of money. I want my name on the side of the building. Um, so this is a naming rights economic legal question. And this is actually the Jewish source examining it, right? Which is to what extent if we become the, um, let's just say, who wants to put up a lot of money for our new sanctuary? Uh, who are we going to pick on the call? Mm hmm. Bess. Let's say that Bess, since she's on the phone and not visible, we won't see a reaction, decides she wants to donate a cool million, if she has it, to rename the next uh, uh, sanctuary, the Bess and Don Nechamovitz, um, uh, I don't know, sanctuary. So um, what rights does she have? So here's the issue. Since people from all over the world give to the shul, and for all of its needs, so they're going to describe an issue with Rav Ashi where he built a particular shul, but it's like this. You can't sell it because how could you ever get the consent of all of the people that gave in other words, it's simply implausible that you'd be able to get the consent. Now, the difference... Have I? Yeah. What if you... I'm, I, I'm getting ahead a little bit, I think. But what if you, when the shul was first started, and you raised money from, let's say, 10 big donors in order to start the shul, but you got them all to agree that if at some future date uh, it became important to sell the shul, would they stipulate yes if such and such body or or such and such number of members agreed then we are okay with it being sold 
Right, so this is part of the issue. You know, what you could do in modern context, and some organizations do, is when you give them a large donation, they send you a contract. And the contract explains, look, if we decide to change course, you consent. Or you could do what they've done. You know, I've been on boards of local institutions, and sometimes you raise money for one thing, and it turns out that you don't need money for that thing. You need money for another thing. Like you think you're getting a new building, but then you abandon the new building idea and you need to improve your existing building. So you go to the donors. Now you don't have to go to the donors usually, but it's the right thing to do to go to the donors if it's a substantial amount of money and say, look, I know you gave for X. Are you okay if we use it for Y? Times have changed and we really, we don't need it for X anymore. We need it for Y. And they'll either say, give me my money back or sure, whatever you want, right? Cynthia. Yeah, I have an interesting story about this because um, the shul that I was involved with in Northern California was literally condemned when I first joined the shul. I used to sit next to a window in case I had to jump out if there was an earthquake. Because literally had to say <laughs> over it that it was condemned and unsafe. So they put together a whole amazing fundraising plan to, to build a replica of a Polish wooden shul. I can't remember which, as the replacement, right? So they got all kinds of funds from different kinds of groups that were interested in that particular project. But then that project fell through and we ended up building like a regular school, like whatever. And so I don't, I don't remember any of the details, but this exact question came up, which was like, wait a minute, we're not getting a Polish wooden shul. Like it was going to be this beautiful, historic, architecturally, like amazing restoration, you know, and now we have like a, a building like any other. So it was very similar. Right. So, so this is sort of the issue, which is, so, you know, the NAFCA mean, the difference between these two approaches is actually what Donnie was saying, I think, or maybe what Cynthia is saying, Lu Yitsu, or what it were that you could, in fact, contact people, or when they donated, you stipulated, thanks for the donation, we may change plans at some course, I hope you know that, nothing's forever except a diamond, whatever. So then, Maybe you could, right? In other words, for the second opinion in suppose it's about the consent of the donors and there's some sense, it's not fleshed out that at least at some level of donation, people have like an ownership interest in the shul such that by donating, they get a veto or at least a say. Now in modern legal systems, we do newspaper advertisements if you wanna let people know, right? They didn't have that. so. Also a query, you know, if you could advertise publicly, right now, you know, you need to let people know about this. You need to let people know that something they have a right to is going to happen. You don't not do anything because you'll never inform everyone involved or interested. You advertise it publicly, right? Isn't that what you do? The, it, newspapers have long lists of legally required advertisements. So it's not clear to me to what extent if this Jewish law had continued to develop, and it would, in a modern system, whether within the second opinion, those sorts of things, public advertisement, stipulations upon donation, contacting the donors, right? Like now everyone who donates goes right into our computer. We could send a mass email to all our donors like that. I could do it in 10 seconds, wherever they are. Even if they were in outer space, they'd get it on their iPhone, right? So um, they didn't have that ability. Does that change? Does the second opinion allow for those leniencies? In my opinion, it does. Um, whereas the first opinion suggests is something much more. It's a public heritage. You can't get rid of a public heritage site. Um, now, uh, I, I, I have a question about this. Sorry. Yeah. Does the intervention of a Yovo year make any difference, or would it make any difference? Ah, what? Because, what? Yeah. Because okay. uh, I, I mean, it, holistically, there's a different concept of ownership, unlike common law countries where it's assumed where ownership is eternal, theoretically. Uh, Logically, we reject that notion, right? In fact, but the Oval Year also applies only to Israel, doesn't uh, it? That's true. Well, and so does it apply when the temple is standing or not itself is a debate? Uh, so Peter, the Talmud is going to go right there. It's like you read ahead. Oh, really? It's going to okay. go, I mean, not directly, but it's going to say, like, wait a second, who owns synagogues? Do people own synagogues? Who? And then it's going to say, who owns land? Period. You know, what is land ownership in Halakha? We're about to go, like, that's going to be the next thing we do. 
after one little detour. So I'm going to say, hold on, because the Talmud is on your page, kind of. Uh, but that's the best kind of being deferred, is when the Talmud is concerned with the same issue. Um, any other comments or questions about this sort of where we are? Okay. I hope it's okay that, you know, in this class, I sometimes like to veer into an interesting Tosafot or Rashba or whatever, not exhaustively, like we don't do them all, but if I think there's an interesting legal issue that presents that I think you should know reflects deeply on the sugya, that, it, that I, I may spend some time kind of fleshing it out to understand the paradigm. So the two paradigms of ownership here are really different for a city. You know, is it that, you know, the shul of the Maharal in Prague is a national treasure and you can never sell it? Or is it that over the seven, 800 years that that shul has existed, God knows how many people have acquired some kind of veto or say in its running and how could you ever get the consent of those people in practice? And if you could, okay. Amar Rev Ashi. I be kanishta de mata mechasya afa gav de meamu asala kevan de adaita didika asu i baina mas mas bininala. So Rev Ashi said this synagogue in Mata Mechasia. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to pull up the map of Mata Mechasia. You, you know, people are on computers, so you, if you're like, where is that? Somewhere in Iraq, sure. But I don't know if you're in my browser. Do you, do you see the Gamaris or do you see my new search? Do you see Mata Mechasia? Do you see the new search? Oh, okay. So, uh, is there a map? There's no map of a place. I would expect Wikipedia to have a map. Well, that's not helpful. The whole point was a map. Okay, fine. Point is. But have you donated to Wikipedia so that you can make that claim? I have. I have. Um, <clears throat> and so, if Wikipedia would dis decide to shut down, could they? Mata Mechasia was a town in southern Babylonia near Sura. They're, they're saying Surah is Mata Mechasia in, in Google. Uh -huh. Okay, Surah. Um, yeah, which is what the Gemara also says. Okay, so Rav Alshi is in Mata Mechasia. Ava gav de me'am asa la keben da daiti ditika asu ibainam is beninala. So he says, look, it's true. People come from all over, but they come adaita didi. So this is a hard phrase. They come with my consent. <laughs> kaasu. Adaita didi kaasu. According to my decisions, they come. Therefore, if I want, I can sell it. So what does that mean? They, so Um. Perush. So this is in the Ritva that I wanted to show you. Do you see the Ritva here? Sheim b'nei olam nas nu chalkam al datam nas nu v'gam im b'nei ir akdishu akevan sheim biasam lekan ella. If people from the world give money, I'll that time last new. I think what he's saying is the following thing. Like we run this synagogue, you know what I'm saying? I, I think this is a, like, there are some synagogues where the board, or in this case, the rabbi, you know, it's a different model, are really in charge and it's really their place. And even though it's a really large place, it's their place. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no doubt whose place it is. It's not a, it's not a public trust. It's run by a person, right? Like. Um, Maybe, give an example. When the Lubavitcher Rebbe was alive, maybe, 770. 
Yeah. He ran that place. Right. So if the Lubavitcher Rebbe decided he wanted to sell 770 and move to 1010. <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose he probably could have, even though it's a place that people came to from all over the world. Right. I don't know. So you see what I'm saying? No, there are times where the ownership is stronger. So Ravash, she's kind of saying, I rule with an iron fist. Okay, Mesteve. So we have a contradiction. That's what Mesteve means, um, like a, a response from Meshiv. So this is like, think tennis, here's a volley back. So we have this general principle. So we asked the question, can you sell a shul? And the answer was, you can't sell a shul, except for large cities. But then we had some exceptions to the, and we said, why? And now we had some exceptions to the large city. Well, if there's some kind of really serious ownership uh, for one person, you know, any shul that Pearl Wolf of blessed memory would have been in charge of, based on what I'm told about her, she would have run, yeah? And so it could have been sold, even if it was a thing, because she ran it, like it was her thing. Amar of Yehuda, shall tour seem. So there were these um, bronze workers, workers of Nechoshet, Yerushalayim. Now, no one can say that Yerushalayim is not a city. You know, it's a city that people, it's the Jewish city, yes? So there were these bronze workers in Jerusalem. They sold it to Rabbi Eliezer, and he used the shul for his private needs, meaning whatever he wanted, his home, his wood shop, whatever he wanted to do there. Not a shul. So the Gemara asks, So isn't it in the city? But the answer is no. First of all, Zutihava, it was small. So this is a trade shul, right, of just the bronze workers. And I think. You know, people will be familiar with this from Polish synagogues, yes? There are many, many Polish synagogues of different, anyone who's been to Poland, every trade union group has a synagogue, right? But even in the Gemara, the bronze workers have a bronze workers synagogue. So that's not the significant detail, but because it's just the bronze worker synagogue, it's not that big. It's small, even though Yerushalayim is a big city, but this Shul Sadani, this gets to what you were saying, you know, what if there are many shuls, right? Most very large cities have many shuls. So part of the answer is, if you're a small shul in a big city, we're not talking about you. You know, we're not talking about the bronze worker shul. And we're probably not talking about any shul in Providence, because there's no shul in Providence, which is the shul. Providence has many mm, small and medium-sized shuls, you know what I'm saying? But none of them are like it. Maybe there were, once upon a time, many large shuls, but this, this one was relatively small. Um, and the bronze workers built it themselves. So the question how much you want to emphasize different parts of this, right? but there are two kind of things here. One, it's small. And two, they built it. The people that wanted it built it. So that kind of harkens back. It builds on what we had with Ravashi of like, I run this place. We built it. It's our shul. And it's not that big. So you can sell it. Uh, does this make intuitive sense to people? Questions or comments? It, it does make sense, but they seem such different <laughs> sets of terms, like the small versus the who built it. Yeah, so I'm well, having they're... a hard time like not wanting to prioritize the issue of the ones who built it over this the size yeah. issue because the size issue seems so relative depending on like where well, it is. I agree. They're conflating both. I mean they're talking about who built it and that it's small. So they're really not helping uh, distinguish which if either Sounds alone if either alone would be sufficient. Because right. they're they're using both here. Oh it's what a, about a word about the development of halakha for a moment. Um, so at least in this case, one of the ways the Gemara develops halakha is ma'aseh, precedent, right? And one of the interesting things, just like in American case law, um, is that judges tend to rule on the facts of the case they have before them and tend not to force legal issues that aren't required. 
So you can imagine, since we're dealing with an actual case here where a shul was sold, the issue goes something like this before the court. And I know it doesn't help because we're looking at the Gemara not to know like what happened in that case. We want to know what the law is. And we're still looking for an outline, like which factor here is determinative. Is it that small shuls can't be sold? Or, or could a shul be small? Like Toro's not large, but what about a small shul that's still like the public, right? So, but here in this case, the judge, the rabbi, the postic was able to easily dispense with the case because it was both small and built by the particular small group of people that used the shul. So it's an easy case, you follow? Now, easy cases don't make good Gemara as we're dealing with. We, like the Gemara, when it asks about suppositions and hypotheticals, it always asks the hardest case. And sometimes the cases are outlandish and fanciful because it's specifically trying to ask about the complicated issue. But real cases that happened um, don't have the Gemara's benefit of asking the laser sharp question because that happened to be whatever happened. You know, it was like, it was the bronze workers and there weren't a lot of bronze workers in Jerusalem. So I don't know if that answers the sort of, all I, all I could say is, that doesn't answer the actual question of like, well, which is it? But it does answer the like, why is the Gemara giving us this sort of muddled statement? I think that makes sense. Um, okay. Now we move to Peter's issue. Who owns land anyway these days in Jewish law? What is land ownership all about? And we're going to do it with like a whole hop, skip, and a jump. So it's one of these. We've got to settle back for a long, complicated, dense, hard to understand discussion. These are the kinds of the Gemara discussions that put people to sleep and cause people to leave Gemara classes. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but we're going to do it. Uh, we're going to persist knowing that we have some willpower and also that just on the other side of this, there are more sweet stories and things like that. Like right on the other side of this, can you turn a synagogue into a brewery? So we're going to deal with that question. Can we open up a craft brewery instead of a synagogue if we want to? In Providence, it might be popular. So, but first, th this issue. Mesave, we have a contradiction, uh, an, uh, um, uh, an objection from the Baraisa. Uh, Baraisa, by the way, Baraita is Aramaic for, I like to just throw this in, for what? Who, who knows? Baraita means. Well, this is good. It will justify me in saying it. Baraita means chutz outside. So Baraita is a description for anything outside of the Mishnah. It's not in the canon. So it's a teaching that's around. It's an authoritative teaching, but it didn't make it into the Mishnah and it didn't make it into the Tosefta. When the Gemara says Vitanya and it taught, it is taught, um, you usually mean a Baraita outside of the canon versus Vitanin versus Vitanan and we taught we taught means it's in our uh, more official teaching, yeah? So Vitanya is a Baraita is outside of the mission. It's a statement people know. Now, objections from Baraito, just so people understand, are weaker than objections from a Mishnah. If you have an objection on a Mishnah from a Mishnah, now you're objecting from within the canon, whereas now we're objecting from within other things people say, you know? People say lots of things. Okay, Meitave. So... So it says in Vayikra, maybe someone has the full Asuk, maybe we can pull it up. Thanks, Faria, let's just pull up the full Pasuk, which is always good. Okay, everyone see the full Pasuk. First good rule of Gemara learning. You should never just let them quote you something and not look up the context. It's really easy to do, by the way, and I do it all the time. It's like, you just read it and you go, you need to know what they're quoting because they're not even quoting the full thing. They're, they're just hoping you know it. When you enter the land of Canaan that I'm giving you as an inheritance or as a possession, and I give a um, tzara'at, uh, 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 leprosy-like affliction to you in the land of your uh, inheritance, yeah? 
The owner of the house, so we're talking about a negatzara'a to plague this in your house, right? You say to the Kohen, there is, you know, something like a, something, I don't know, right? But something that looks like a plague has appeared on my house. Plagues, sorry, happens. <laughs> Sensitive subject. So, sara'at <clears throat> in your house. That's the context. So, Bivet Eretz Achuzatchem in the yes, Nagatzarat in the upon a house in the land of your inheritance. Achuzatchem mitma benegaim the in Yerushalayim mitma benegaim. So you might learn from this what that your inheritance can be afflicted by negaim but not Yerushalayim, because Yerushalayim is not your inheritance. No one can do anything with, it's not yours. You don't own Jerusalem. No one owns Jerusalem. The mayor of Jerusalem doesn't own Jerusalem. The city council doesn't own Jerusalem. Prime minister doesn't own Jerusalem. The Jewish people own Jerusalem. Yeah, it's, do you see the analogy to the synagogues we're talking about here? There are certain synagogues that no one owns that synagogue, and there are certain places that no one owns that place. You might learn this. I'm Rabbi Yehuda. I need those shemati ala makom mikudash bilvad or makom mikdash bilvad. Trying to see if Rabbi, we... yeah. Doesn't God own Yerushalayim? Okay, God. No people own Yerushalayim. Good point. I thought we're not allowed to sell land in Yerushalayim because it, we don't own it. All right. So that's what this is. You're saying like, who does own it? I thought that we, and because it, it would be the whole idea of, of Yuval and and um, and the whole idea of the Shemitah year, all that we don't own the land. It's so we're well. So now we're clarifying what land do we or don't we own. So we're, that's the issue. It's this, it, it itself is a subject of debate here a little bit, a little bit. Now, of course, all of the land is subject to Shemitah and Yuval, but not Bismana Zer really. Right, in the sense that, well, so we're trying to clarify the ownership interest, and this is just one part of that discussion. Okay. Which, which is, it's not the only part, right? Part of it's you might have to give back your house in a certain number of years, and so you just have like a, I don't know, what would be the common law equivalent of that kind of ownership? It would be a, like, a, um, uh, you know, like a, a life tenancy or, uh, someone help me. What would be the name of an interest where you could, you know, you could live in a place for a certain number of years? A lease. It's not really a lease. No. You own it for a certain number of years. It's more, it, it's more like a, it's a certain kind of ownership interest, but it's not full ownership. You know. There's a lot of this in Jane Austen books, right? Where the the family, the the father or the family gets to live in the house, but then it passes out out of the family, so they don't right. really own it. They're kind of living there, but they also have a certain kind of a lease. Yeah, I, I would call it like a life tenancy. I think that you could probably use that term in I, law. Maybe. My, my problem with the metaphor <laughs> is it's trying to analogize a structure to land. In other words, the, the, the Chumash is saying the house is impure, but the land is not. And they're going to use this to say the, the shul is, in other words. Well, wait, wait, you'll see, you'll wait to see how they use it. They use right. it in an interesting okay. way. All right. So, I'm a Rabbi Yehuda, I only heard this thing that, I didn't hear that Yerushalayim can't become Tameh. You know, because just follow, in order to become Tameh, it has to be an Achuzai. There has to be some human ownership interest. Things that God owns, let's just assume God's ownership for the moment, don't become Tameh. Things that people own become Tameh. So, so the first version of it says that God owns Yerushalayim and therefore it can never become Tameh. Rabbi Yehuda says, no, God doesn't own Yerushalayim. He owns Makum Mekudash Bovad. He owns the temple now. And that can't become Tameh. Right, but I only heard it about that. Now, follow. We're still in the objection. Ha bate kinesio divate midrashot mitamim. Am I? 
so from this, if you take this statement from Rabbi Yehuda, who we were quoting before, he says, the temple in Jerusalem can't become Tomei. Infer from that, that what? That he doesn't say all places of worship. He says the temple in Jerusalem. So how about the Knesset to Vatim Midrashot? Mitamim. But but they Knesset and Vatim Midrashot do become Tamei. But Amai, we just learned that Vatim Knesset and Vatim Midrashot of Krachin, of large cities, aren't owned by the owners. Aren't owned by the owners. They're owned by... So here, Donnie, who are they owned by? I would say they're owned by the public, because that's where Tosafot is leading, right? And, and the broad public, so they don't have permission to sell. This is where the lambdas helps. What's the Gemara assuming? What's the Hava Amina? Just follow this for a second. The yeah. Hava Amina of the Gemara is something like God owns the Temple Mount, and so that can't become Tameh. But it doesn't say that synagogues can't come Tameh. Learn from that that God doesn't own the synagogues. But we said... Now, the Gemara thinks that this is an objection, right? It thinks that this is a contradiction to what we said before, that synagogues in large cities can't be sold. Because why? Because, well, this is the complicated piece. It's actually a different reason. You see how the Lemdus actually tears this whole question apart? We've learned too much. So the question almost doesn't start for us. Yeah? Because it's not apples and apples. It's apples and oranges. God owns the temple. They can't. Temple can't become well, Tamei. We, even, I, we were just, never saying, well, let me just finish the yeah. thing, I'll get to you. Talk. We were never saying in the Rishonim, the way we were learning the Gemara, that God owns synagogues of large cities and that's why they can't be sold. We were saying that we'll never be able to give proper legal notice to all the donors or it's a public trust for all the people that might come. Not that God owns it. So that's a different reason why they can't be sold. So according to that line of thinking, yeah, even if they could become tame, qua, they're owned by someone, just because they're owned by someone and not God doesn't mean that someone who owns it can sell it. Maybe someone who owns it is restricting from selling it because of their role or because of this other secondary notice issue. Does that make sense? Doctor. Well, I just, it's not, I, to me, it's not even saying that. It's saying God owns the site, Makom. It's not even the temple. I see, it's, yeah. It's the land. Mm -hmm. so, it, it, so it's even less applicable to any structure, oh, let alone a structure not built on, on you know, the Temple Mount. Because yeah. so it says, Ella Makom, Makadesh Bilvad. And and then you go down to Bate Knesio, Bate Mishdra Shot. You know, it's not, it it seems to me that that's the wiggle room. If if Rab Yehuda is saying it's the place and not the structure, then it's never the structure. The and, rabbi... and, and then mm -hmm. it's it's just never the structure. And if it's never the structure, you can sell it. Oh, sorry. So I just want to, yeah, I, I just want to clarify. I misread a little. Um, um, the original way of reading it was Makum Nikdash Bilvad, the place of the temple. And now they're going to answer and say, Amar of Yehuda, Anilo Shemati Ala Makum Mikudash Bilvad. Change that reread the Baraitas, not Makoma Mikdash, Makom Mikudash. He heard this about synagogues, about holy sites. So you see, now he changes in response to the Gemara's question. Makom Mikudash. It's even synagogues can't get Nagayim because they're owned by God. And since synagogues can't get Nagayim because they're owned by God in large cities, but this is weird because some synagogues you can sell. So wait, we're saying that synagogues in large cities are owned by God? Okay, lots of people. We've got Donnie, then Cynthia. Okay, I'm, I'm confused about one thing. So the Gemara, the discussion is taking place in Surah or Bubble or wherever, wherever it's being take, taking place. But are they only talking about synagogues in Eretz Yisrael or Yerushalayim, 
or are they talking about <coughs> isn't right. and isn't there a difference in land ownership that's what i said before isn't there a difference in land ownership between eretz israel and chutzlaris presumptively yes but what they're they're breaking that down a little bit for synagogue something like synagogues have a little bit of the avir of eretz israel you know what i'm saying in other words once we're in a synagogue when we explain from makoma mikdash to makom mikudash we're essentially saying that somehow synagogues, even in Bavel, suddenly fall under the halacha of Bevet Eretz Achuzatzchem, of the land of your inheritance. So even a synagogue in Providence has a little bit of the kedusha of God ownership of you know, the because temple. It's a because it's a mikdash ma'at. They're essentially codifying the concept of mikdash ma'at. I, um, I just will admit, oh, Cynthia, yeah, I don't think I understand all this particular distinction, but at the moment when they started to talk about the sacred site versus the structure on it, it seemed like it went back to the very first thing that we studied about the public square becoming a sacred site. And it, was, it wasn't about the building, it was about what made that a sacred site. So I don't, I don't have any answers to what you're talking about now, but it just did take me back maybe mm -hmm. wrongly to that opening question that we had. No, okay, right, it does uh, have resonance of the opening question. I'm struggling really with the Gemara. Uh, I'm just gonna be honest here because I don't understand the Gemara's line of questioning. Um, unless you say, uh, and here's why I don't understand, yeah? Um, and I, um, this is what can happen if you like apply your lumdus to specifically. Suddenly, you know, you're learning it a certain way and the Gemara doesn't even make sense the way you're learning it, but it's the way all of the Rishonim are learning it. So you know you're not off in crazy land. You're doing what people have done for thousands of years in understanding this tradition. But the flow of the question of the Shaklavataria is hard to comprehend. So you have to refine it. So it's easy to just pass over and say whatever. But this is actually where we come to do it, and then, then we may actually do that. But, um, but this is where we can come to deep understanding. So I just want to attempt to explain my difficulty and then attempt at least a possible resolution. And then we'll pick up next time with like less, well, with the, the end of this discussion and, and it gets simpler uh, and more practical. But I think there is something nice about these difficult discussions too. Follow me. We said before, uh, you know, we're talking about selling synagogues of large cities. And you can't do it. And why can't you do it? And Tosafot gave two reasons, which reflect all the Rishonim. Either too many people donated to it, or people come from all over to pray there, and they're relying on it. It could be reliance, or it could be public ownership of some kind, or like trust. A halachic conception of a trusteeship, that they're trustees for the site. Now, we then discussed and said, well, when it comes to Israel, you can't get a nega in something, um, in uh, uh, an affliction, uh, a plague, unless you own it, unless it's achuza, unless there's an inheritance ownership. But some things you don't own. And then we debated what are those things? Is it Yerushalayim? Is it all of Yerushalayim? Is it, is it just the temple? And then Rabbi Yehuda said it's the temple. And then they said, ah, if it's the temple, but synagogues, synagogues, um, you know, you can synagogues get nigaim? Um, and he said, oh gosh, you're right. I guess when I said temple, I meant makom mikudash, any sanctified space, including synagogues. Um, so you don't own them. You didn't build it. I sound like, I sound like a former president. You didn't build that. Yeah. Um, so you can't sell it. You don't own it. So, but here's the issue. The temple, we're not saying where I thought we were saying God owns it, and that's why I can't get Nagaim. Whereas the synagogue, we're not saying God owns it, we're saying actually the exact opposite of God owning it. It's just that the individuals don't own it who daven there, everyone owns it, but not that God owns it. So they're comparing these things where they're trying to make it equivalent, like God owns So you have to break one of those down in a different way. And so the two possibilities are to say in the line of questioning the following kind of thing. When we say that the Makom Mikdash doesn't get Nagayim, it's not because God owns it. 
It's because it's public Jewish ownership. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. And once it's public Jewish ownership in that case, then the question makes a lot more sense. Well, that place doesn't get Nagayim because it's public Jewish ownership. And what about synagogues of large cities? They also don't get Nagayim because they're public Jewish ownership. Then that's a question, you know what I mean? Or, or you reverse it the other way. Tosafot notwithstanding, ah, uh, synagogues of large cities, you can't sell them because they're owned keviachol by God. Just like the temple is owned, so to speak, by God. And the fact that people from all over donate to it or come to it is just a sign that it's a special holy site. Kedusha Tachamura. It's got more Kedusha, like the Beit HaMikdash, right? Because it's like Kilu God owns it, you know, because it's the Turo Synagogue. God owns the Turo Synagogue. It's a temple in Jerusalem. Um, sorry, Rabbi Mandel, if you're listening on Facebook and considering selling them, right? So, so... Do you, you understand you have to uh, equal, equilibrate these two cases because the Gemara is comparing them. Now, a difficulty is you leave all of this saying, either way, we know you can sell. Whatever can get Nagayim, you can sell. And whatever can't get Nagayim, you can't sell. You wind up with a weird result from this Gemara, which is that a small synagogue like Congregation Beth Shalom or Mishkan Tfila or the Pathakit Shalom, pick your favorite small shul, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Dr. Dr. Mandelbaum, uh, my Beth, a, Beth Joseph, Beth Joseph <laughs> can get Nigayim, but you know the, but I don't know Yeshurun in Jerusalem or the Great Synagogue of Jerusalem can't. In other words, you wind up saying that certain synagogues are subject to Nigayim; they could get an affliction, and therefore you can sell them because only things you own get afflicted. And so, like, if your synagogue got Nagayim, it's a sign from heaven that you don't really, <laughs> you don't really own it, because um, that you do really own it. Because if you didn't really own it, and either God owned it or the public owned it, it couldn't get that kind of affliction, yeah? Um, do you see what I'm saying? But that's a weird result, that certain synagogues do get Nagayim, and other synagogues don't Nagayim. And the ones that are subject to Machlokas, like Rav, As, uh, Rav Ashi in Matim Machasi, you know, I built it, or the bronze workers in Jerusalem, it's like, the Machlokas, could they get Nagayim? I don't know. That seems weird to me as a result that certain synagogues are theoretically subject to this, this affliction and others not, but that's where we get. Now, the Gemara is going to do something it does, and I'll just preview the next time. Um, kamipalge, or as they sing Yeshivish, Bumai Kamifligi, uh, depends if you're like speaking Hebrew correct Aramaic, Bumai Kamipalge, or the Yeshivish way people learn here, like me. But my kamiflagi. So, um, uh, how are you gonna? Um, what are what are they arguing about? So I'll just say it, and then we'll do it next time. Tanakama Savar, the first one that says that Jerusalem. So this is just the goof of the matter, right? This is just like to learn. We kind of dealt with the issue for our purposes, yeah. Uh, but now while we're here, what are they like? Someone said that Jerusalem can't get Nagayim, and someone else said no, just the temple, and then they amended just synagogues. So what's the debate in Jerusalem? There are no nagayim versus just in the temple. There are no nagayim. Well, the debate is: Was Jerusalem given as ownership to the tribes or not? If you say that Jerusalem was never given as ownership, then you can't get nagayim there. But if you say that Jerusalem was given as ownership, it was. So we're now going to do that sugya uh, next time. We'll open with it of like who owns Jerusalem. Uh, which is a fun sugya. Maybe we should announce that the class will be titled Who, Who Really Owns Jerusalem Anyway? Um, and then after that, we'll get to the question I know you've all been waiting for, which is um, can you sell your synagogue and build a craft brewery on the site instead? <laughs> that is the question we'll get to. Um, so those two things are the things we'll do next time. So to review I've... what we, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I will just tell you, in Tupper Lake, the craft brewery is extremely successful. The shul, less so. <laughs> so and, and again, just like freeloading is not a new problem, the popularity of beer over shul is apparently <laughs> not a new problem either. So, Is that um, what's happening to the site of the old shul? No, yeah. no, 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 no. It's, <laughs> it, we're doing okay. We're hanging in. Oh, I'm no, no, not saying. you. The oh. one in Providence. Oh, no. the one in Providence. No, but it is the paradigmatic case in the Gemara. So, um, <laughs> so here's here's what I've got for you. 
today we started with a discussion of synagogues and large, we started with a review, but then we discussed synagogues and large, can you sell a shul? And the answer broadly is, yeah, you can sell a shul unless it's of a large city. And then we asked why, and we examined two possible approaches in the Rishonim and what that might mean and the implications of that and what updates might exist in a modern context, uh, you know, for why you can't sell a shul in a large city, who really owns it. And then um, we discussed uh, two different cases, um, one shul in a large city, where even though it was in a large city, but it was very clear who was in charge. So that's a different kind of thing, right? There's a large shul, but it is, it's not operated for the broad public interest. It's operated by someone or group of people for their interests. And when that is very clear, even in a large city, there's a hector. You know what I'm saying? So uh, just to make this clear, even a really large shul in Manhattan, a lot of them are not operated as a sort of public benefit, like public resource. They're operated for their members, right? They might even say in the charter, this synagogue is formed and operated for, could be a thousand people. But there are some shuls in Manhattan that are operated as a public resource kind of, or become that way through their operation. I'm thinking of the Spanish Portuguese synagogue uh, as an example of a synagogue that maybe crosses a line or, or perhaps KJ, I don't know, or some of these other, you know, like monument synagogues of sorts, you know what I'm saying? So you have to make the call in a large city, is this a shul that's for the public? I think in Europe, by the way, having, you know, traveled to Europe some, a lot of the shuls in Europe really feel a little bit more like they're operated for the public. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure there's a board to these shuls, but when you go to these shuls, do people know what I'm talking about? They feel like they're operated for, for travelers that might come and for dignitaries and for ceremonies and their government relates to the Jews in those sites. They're like official sites of Jewry. So they're not operated as your shul. They're operated as like the spokesperson in a building of the Jews, right? For the Jews and Klape Chutzes and for non-Jews, right? It's like both. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Uh, yeah, so, or that historical synagogue, in any event. So Rev, uh, uh, Rev Ashi's synagogue gives us precedent that if the synagogue really is operated privately, even if it's large and in a big city, it should still be sold. And then we have the president of the Torsiim, of the bronze workers in Jerusalem who are in a large city, but it's a small shul. And it's for the Torsiim. It's just for the people who are bronze workers. So that's like the easier case, actually. Okay. Then we discussed this other issue, which is really, can you sell a shul? You know, um, <coughs> at first we had this teaching which suggested in a Baraita that um, shuls were not immune to nigaim and if shuls are not immune from nigaim they can all be sold you follow that was the gemara's question if all shuls can get nigaim all shuls, all shuls are sellable and the gemara answered that by amending the brighta to say no certain shuls can't get nigaim and therefore they can't be sold they actually changed the brighta due to the force of their contradiction. I have like issues with their comparison of the Beis Amigdash to the shuls because the reason the Beis Amigdash can't be sold and the reason the shuls can't be sold are different reasons, you follow? So I'm like stuck on that. It seems like they're different reasons. So I suggested that maybe they're not different reasons really. And maybe I need to readjust my thinking as a result of the Gemara's comparison. And that's where we ended. So that's what we did today. Um, if you followed that, great. If not, this was pretty complex. It's about as complex as it'll get in this chapter. So it only go, gets easier from here, but hopefully this has enriched your understanding of uh, Jewish law vis-a-vis uh, -vis sacred space and the selling of shul. And we are gonna get to the issue, which is can a board just sell a shul, period, and do whatever it wants. Right? Is it, you know, we're talking about selling with restrictions and encumbrances, but maybe a board can just say to hell with it. We wanna do what we wanna do and we're the board. Can the board do that? The answer is going to be yes, but we'll get there. Thank you, everyone. Rabbi, can I ask you to give me a minute uh, for a question? Yeah, let me just get us off Facebook yeah. Live and off the recording. <laughs> Unless you want to broadcast no, no, no. your question to the... It's, it's no, you are correct. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
All done. Yep. Good night. Good night. Good night. It's good to see you all. Good night. Happy kiss leave. Ah, yes. So the question.